All right. So welcome. The show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez, here on LaGuardia Web Radio. We started the show with some Peter Gabriel from the 80s, uh, Lead a Normal Life, which is interesting because he wrote this, uh, and he says he wrote it about mental illness, but this was before he even was diagnosed with depression as a result of his uh, the end of his first marriage. And he's also pretty well known for being very outspoken about group therapy and couples therapy and all that kind of stuff. And I put that on because uh, my guest today is uh, Ben Journey. And uh, Ben uh, is with the Division of Adult and Continuing Education. He's here to talk about a four-year, $1.6 million grant from the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration uh, that's going to be used to train students to become mental health peer support workers. Uh, welcome, Ben. Say hi. Thanks for having me, Hugo. It's a pleasure to be here. Got it. And uh, we actually, we, we first touched base because I was looking for feedback from folks around this issue of mental health services for CUNY students. And you had, I don't know whether you just reached out to me or you were encouraged either by the president or somebody else to and we had we kind of talked a little bit about the grant then, uh, and then we've touched base. And I thought it would be a good idea to have you on the show because this is important work. And uh, you want, but you want to start a little bit by introducing yourself. Talk a little bit about yourself, your background, and maybe some of your own studies before Laguardia. Sure. Um, so I am from New York City, uh, born and raised. I grew up in uh, Greenwich Village, and. Um, snake my way around the city for school. I went to elementary school on the west side down by the river. Um, I went to high school uh, in the Bronx. Um, and uh, then I went to college uh, upstate um, at Skidmore College and uh, uh, majored in dramatic writing there. And uh, I'm, I'm still in New York. I haven't left, I haven't escaped. I'm still uh, trapped in uh, a city I really love. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, dramatic writing? Dramatic writing. What are you talking about, yep. theater? Theater, film, TV, um, uh, not to be confused with Germanic writing, which was like something I got a lot. Um, but yeah, so like my thesis was uh, a, a TV, like a teleplay. Um, and uh, I did a lot of comedy. Oh, I see. Right. And when you said you went to, to high school in the Bronx, was it what, like Bronx Science or something? I mean, Skidmore is an, a pretty good school, right? It's a, I think it's oh, private, yeah. right? Yeah, private yeah. Private school. And, and uh, so what was your high school uh, in the Bronx? School? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're a pretty smart guy. I mean, you're, I mean, you're, you're well educated. So how did you find yourself going from you know, writing for the theater to find yourself working in adult and continuing education. How'd that, how'd that happen? Yeah, so that was a long snaking journey. Um, I'd say the real kind of uh, pivot point was I was doing continuing education uh, myself at Columbia and uh, I was kind of exploring, um, you know, the uh, 2020 election really kind of like a lot of people my age really set off a lot of what am I doing? What can I be doing? What should I be doing? What's possible out there? And so um, I was at Columbia um, doing research, social science research, and um, looking for something to do um, on the side. And there was an adult education program there. There was a high school equivalency uh, program on campus run by Community Impact. Um, and so with my English background, I applied to be uh, you know, an English and social studies teacher. Um, and that really opened the door to me for, I guess, for education and um, workforce development at the same time. I really do see those um, as the same thing and uh, really, uh, really fell in love with it there. And, uh, you know, teaching adult students and it was uh, an unforgettable experience. It's got to be interesting for somebody to say that they went to Columbia and they got their, what well, they got their GED though, right? That's right. So, and, and is that popu is the population made up of what folks from that area, like, you know, Harlem it's, and uh, what is it, Morningside Heights? It's almost entirely immigrants from around the city. It's not local. 
um, necessarily. Um, Queens, Brooklyn, I'm trying to remember where most of my students were from. But it depends, you know, there's like, I, I taught night classes one semester, you know, and that's gonna bring in one certain type of population. And I taught day classes another semester, right. and that's kids, you know, that's that's kids in the area who, um, you know, didn't finish high school. You, when you say kids, oh, I was, I was gonna say, so it's like high school age, but did not, high school just didn't yes. work for them. Yes. So, uh, and you know, when you made, made that remark about the continuing education and the workforce development, that is the, the president's no, notions too, right? The president is very, you know, he comes from this workforce background and he has these ideas about the community colleges are, you know, that's the role we can play. And it's one way to, to, to measure success uh, it's been uh, it's been written about yeah. lately. Uh, so anyhow, okay. So you're you're working at Columbia with adult populations. How do you end up at LaGuardia? How did that happen? So that um, that really solidified this um, love of education and um, this feeling like uh, you know that's kind of the way I can contribute to you know my city and state and hopefully country one day. Um, and so there was a master's program at Columbia, um, like a master of public administration program at the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, and so I uh, took, I, I enrolled, I got into that program, lucky enough to get into that program. And um, one of the uh, internship options, right? You have to do an internship, um, you know, your first summer or what have you. And I was going in there very like, like very kind of laser focused, like education, workforce development, right? like, you know, and everyone else was, you know, kind of figuring out their thing. But I, I befriended someone who um, had interned with uh, President Adams, um, you know, at Bronx Community College um, the summer before. And so um, I met President Adams through doing an internship with him um, when I was at Bronx Community College. Um, and so from there, I kind of just, uh, followed along and got, you know, quite lucky to, to, to have that security in my life. What was, uh, since this is a kind of interesting to have this inside track on, on the president, uh, what was he like to work for at, at BCC, that experience? What was it like it was a over monster, there? You know, like a very dictatorship type, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was wonderful. So it's like one eight. He's like you know, Doctor yeah. Jekyll, Mister Hyde. That's just basically the same, the same thing. But like you know, what were you guys doing over there? I mean, just workforce development. So that was so. That's when COVID hit. Was like when my internship started. So, um, you know, it was Gosh. remote basically. Um, but so you know, it was a couple things. You know, he's a really, um, really capable uh, person, and so. He was kind of directing, um, you know, my projects and the projects going on in the workforce development department. Um, so I worked on two things mainly. Um, one of them was doing kind of an audit of um, BCC's kind of crisis response to COVID. Um, and it was just a fascinating case study of, you know, how is any community college, you know, or any, you know, uh, prepared to kind of handle this sort of crisis or how is any school, you know, uh, my dad's a math teacher and, you know, the stories I was hearing from BCC were very similar to the ones my dad was telling me, you know, that was, um, that was a fascinating project. Um, and, and then the other project I worked on was starting to do research for this um, mental health peer thing. I was starting to um, explore the field and develop contacts. And um, so this has been a project that's been going on for, a little while now. So it did, and so that the, I mean, I don't know. And this is one of the things we're going to find out because uh, the, and I can't remember. I guess we, because we met again, like I said before, we met in this research of what services are there for yes. CUNY students. So it was not one of these things that I pick up. You know, reading Laura Bartovic's announcements of <laughs> of grant awards to you know LaGuardia which you know obviously I, I uh, you know I troll I troll the emails for content constantly but uh, 
this is so this is something you were you know i guess it, the, the grant began in the in bcc or is this grant not just a cuny like just not a laguardia grant but a cuny wide thing i mean what was the genesis of the grant this was, you know this 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 was like a research project i guess when i was at bcc you know my 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 uh the the biggest project i was doing was this covid response um investigation um, but at the same time, I was doing this research on this peer thing. Um, and so when President Adams got hired to go to LaGuardia, um, you know, this this project kind of came with us because it was um, it was something that was already in motion. We didn't have any uh, kind of roots planted um, with the program at BCC yet. Um, and they were running a fantastic um, certified recovery peer program um, there. Um, uh, uh, Bob, Bobby, uh, Bobby Hart, uh, I'm sorry, maybe Bobby Sackman, um, um, was running that program for years and, um, tremendously successful, basically working with addiction, um, and training peers to work with. Yeah. I was gonna, yeah. So, so a little, a little different. Cause when you said recovery, when you said recovery, I was thinking, I used to, you're talking about 12 step recovery. Yes. Yes. So the peer field is, um, diverse, but there are certified recovery peers, which is different from. Um, uh, what, what, what we're, we're doing. Yeah, because people who work in with the in 12 step programs or with folks in the 12 step programs, they understand that. And typically, you know, you don't find not all mental health professionals subscribe to the that approach. So if somebody with that experience is going to be able to work with those kinds of people more. I don't know what you say readily, easily. Uh, so you follow, but at, at what point do you write this thing and, you know, get the money and, you know, uh, get the money from the federal government? How did that work? So, so when I, um, I, I came to LaGuardia um, in the fall, I guess, of, uh, I guess, uh, what was that then? Was that 2020? Yeah. Um, after the internship. And, um, you know, then it was like crunch time. Like, do we want to make this thing happen? Like, can we make this thing happen? You know, I was just doing research before, and so um, I worked closely with um, Hannah Weinstock, who's senior director of workforce development, and and you know we started building right. contacts and and um, building networks and saying, okay, if this thing were to happen, you know, where would we get money? You know, can we turn this research into um, you know something real? And so at that point, it was just searching and searching and. Um, uh, you know, there's this big um, federal grant that is really kind of specific to peer support work. Um, and so uh, Hannah and me thought, well, this is, you know, this is probably the best opportunity we'll get. You know, it's really tailor made. So we we worked our butts off on it and uh, got got luck, fortunate enough that that it came through. And it's so you're writing it in the fall and it seems like a quick turnaround, right? I mean, typically, or did it? Did you get it in the summer? Was it that? Because I, I know I've, I've, I've worked with folks on federal grants, and you. I mean, I've got. We've actually got one out right now for recruitment, believe it or not, or actually recruitment in the humanities, and uh, you know we're still waiting to hear. We won't find out till December, and we wrote this thing in in the spring. So was it a quick turnaround for the feds? Yeah. In this well, case? I mean, we started writing in January, basically. Like, so it was a couple month, you know, it was very intense. Uh, I was finishing up grad school at the time, but it was a really quick turnaround. Uh, and my first exposure to like, you know, federal grants, which was just dizzying, just completely dizzying. Yeah, they, they asked for a lot and there's like a whole way it's done. And thank, you know, and thank God for the grants office because those people really uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, helped yes. John as far Parson as telling you what you're going to need and, and helping really, you get all that. Um, important to that process. And so, yeah, I work with John. He's great with budgets. Absolutely. Right? Because he's usually, that's what he usually want and coming up with the narrative for it. So, well, we're talking about this. So, so and by the way, you know, not to be, keep going back and forth with this, but so this notion of the peers and the, this kind of work with a mental health and peer support and job readiness was that coming out of you or was this something that 
that President Adams yeah. pitched to you. This was President at UCC Adams as a part of as an idea. So his it was his idea. Yeah. In the beginning, right? Uh, to kind of him and go Curtis Dan uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Just wondering. I'm always I'm always interested in how you know how how things are born. Sure. How things come together. So let's yeah. let's talk about it. You wrote you wrote this thing. So tell me a little bit about the grant. So this is a um, it's it's a four year grant. Um, like you mentioned at the start, you have a little over a million and a half dollars um, to train uh, 144 students, um, two cohorts per year, and we are going to train them uh, to become peer support uh, workers, mental health peer support workers. Um, and I emphasize that because there are just a billion titles for this profession. Um, it's an emerging field, a couple decades old. Um, the American Psychiatric uh, Association only recognized it, you know, I think around 2016 or 17 as, you know, giving it their stamp of approval. Um, but it is, uh, it's this great field where um, essentially you are someone who has lived experience with mental health challenges and recovery, and you're using that lived experience to help others navigate their own mental health challenges and recovery. And so um, it's, you know, you're not a clinician, you're not a therapist, your job is not to, uh, you know, figure out what your mother did to, you know, you know, to, to, to disrupt your system. You're not, you're on, not the on the couch. No, no. <laughs> you're not no, paid to be on no the couch. In, well, I'm sure there are couches in peer work, but not, not those Freudian uh, recliners. Um, but you're like, you know, you're a buddy and you're a coach. You're gonna you're gonna help get them through their recovery. You're gonna model behavior. You're gonna tell them, you know, your story. Uh, you're gonna help them with the stigma. You're gonna develop these kind of action plans, you know, and help them develop self care tools. Um, and so it's this dynamic kind of position um, with these people who can kind of work alongside social workers and psychiatrists, you know, and, and case managers all on this team. And a peer is usually just one part of that team. Right. How, uh, how are these students chosen? And where do they come? Where does the population Excellent come question. from? Yeah, so that's what we're doing now. Um, and um, we are drawing from, you know, predominantly uh, Queens, but, you know, we're reaching out to um, the community based organizations that LaGuardia has relationships with um, the Workforce Education Center um, and Claudia Baldonado has been uh, really important to this process of, of reaching students um, and students of all ages. Um, you know, we're looking for 23 year olds who have a little perspective about, you know, their recovery, which might be a little rarer, you know, maybe we'll get more 28 year olds. Um, but then we're we're looking for fifty year olds right. as well. You know, we're trying to kind of run span the span the age range here. Right. And, yeah, I know Claudia uh, through the yes. summer youth employment program. So I know that Claudia yes. uh, knows the population. And but again, so how are these folks uh, identified? Or you're, you're sending putting you're putting out a flyer basically, and. And and what are what are the what are the bullet points? Uh, have to you know have to have what recovered? Have have some personal experience with overcoming, uh, you know whatever whatever I don't know what you're calling yeah, it, mental you're, health you're, issues. You're you have you're you're highlighting the exact most difficult thing about this process. So <laughs> so <laughs> good good questioning here. So the program manager uh, Michelle Patterson and I have been. Um, tweaking that language every week. We meet with a different consultant and it changes just a little. But we're saying, putting out a flyer, and we're saying if you have lived experience with mental health challenges and recovery and are interested in helping others, you know, hit up this email address and we're going to have some information sessions to tell you what this role no one quite understands is. And then after that, we'll have an application and you'll have to talk a little bit about your lived experience. You know, we're not trying to re-traumatize people, but, you know, we have to see that you have some perspective about your journey um, and some 
toolkit available that has helped you uh, quote unquote recover, that's a very problematic in some ways phrase, as, as you can imagine, you know? Well, I mean, you know, I think of it two ways. One is I think of it again, back as like 12 step approach where people, you know, uh, you know, in that program, they use the steps, you know, the, the, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which are now applied widely to many different kinds of uh, defined addictions, you know, or things that make people, people are powerless over in, in their lives. Uh, but then I also think of, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about, you know, that thing that, that, uh, that helps you survive. And in some, you know, in some cases, it, for some people it is organized religion, let's say. You know, what, it, mm. what do you believe in when you are in, you know, the bottom, mm. as we, which is talked about, you know, when someone, when you hit bottom, what is that that will, that sustains you? And in the end, that becomes, you know, that important thing in your life, whether it's, you know, it could be family. It could be, you know, it can be anything. I mean, everybody finds uh, that thing that, that helps them get through. Amen. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so. Wow, so this is this is pretty heavy. I mean, I guess, and and it sounds like you're in the in the fledgling stages. So, do you have do you have any students yet? Where, are, where, where uh, have you started? Have you started calling we are groups building. now? We are well, actually <laughs> yes. Today is the day. So you know, today it's going out. Um, you know, the a lot of this project is in the hands of um, a very capable person, Michelle Patterson, who has directed um, programs with the Workforce Education Center before. Uh, the Intern and Earn program, uh, formerly the Young Adult Internship program. Um, and so, yeah, me and her are in the war room. It's going out today. We're going to be monitoring the email, you know, and we're going to get it done. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, in some ways, it can, it can also be recruitment because I'm sure there are, you know, people have names of folks who might even, they might even think are, would be ideal for this. And so I'm, I'm trying in, in understanding the uh, the calendar here, to, uh, in a sense. So this group that you're choosing now, and you're going to get 72 of them. That's the uh, number, right? Because 144, two cohorts divided in half. Uh, I'm doing math here. <laughs> the conversations we've been having. No, we'll yeah. just have 20 per cohort. Um, so over four nice. years. So 20, and we need 20 for January, essentially. Or that, that's cool. Wow. Well, well, that's that that seems a little more manageable because I was thinking about yeah. seventy two. That's quite a number. And is this all going to be happening at LaGuardia? The training, yes. in a sense, I mean, in, as part of the adult continuing education. Yes. So, program. Um, you know, the peer field is a it's a niche field kind. So yes, this is all happening at LaGuardia, um, remote and in person. Um, but we're really really excited to have. Um, a team of kind of really expert um, peer educators, peer service educators, um, who are going to teach people kind of the peer 101. Um, we got this woman named Sarah, uh, Sarah, Sarah Goodman from Baltic Street. Um, we're going to teach them the, the digital literacy skills they need. Um, we got a peer technology module. And then we're going to help them get certified uh, by New York State. Um, they, they, the Office of Mental Health and Rutgers collaborated some years ago to create a New York State uh, peer specialist certification. Um, it's free to take the course online. All you need is lived experience and passion. And, um, and so that's the third component of our program is, is getting someone from, uh, you know, kind of that Rutgers training program. We, we've recruited someone who's going to help students get through that online test. Um, and kind of hold their hand and reinforce key concepts. And so the idea is that when they come out of this program, the goal is for them to be educated, skilled, and credentialed. That's really, that, that, that would be the trifecta. That's what we're shooting for. Okay, I'm actually gonna do, it's, it's 128, but I'm gonna do the, go ahead and do the station break before we get any deeper into this. <laughs> uh, the show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez here on LaGuardia Web Radio, WLGR. And uh, my guest today is Ben Journey of the Division of Adult and Continuing Education. And he's here to discuss a four-year, $1.6 million grant 
from the uh, U.S. Health Resources and Service Administration uh, that will train students to become mental health peer support workers. And, uh, you know, people say $1.6 million and they say, oh, that's a lot of money. But I know that once you start hiring folks, compensating folks, uh, you know, uh, you know, salary plus benefits or whatever and and all the other and you know the obviously the institution has to take a piece and re recover a piece uh for you know housing it so i'm get i'm getting the you know 20 students it's unlikely that they are being paid to do are they being compensated for their time or are they just getting a free uh training uh or an education for and then the notion is to place them in, in some institution that could they are them. it is a free program because of this grant and they are getting a stipend um it's it's not a huge stipend but it's significant enough to to you know say, you know get, get people to buy into such a kind of long training program so they are getting paid is there a number you can tell? Is that part of the flyer? <laughs> Do you no, tell you them what the stipend is? <laughs> are you at liberty to no, tell me? No, you don't. Do you want people who are <laughs> passionate about it? Uh, we want people who are in it to be peer support workers, and it's maybe a little finer print. The and fact that you'll be following the money. Uh, and how long? And how long do they are they a part of this? How long does this? How long is the process going to take? Uh, three months in the classroom. Um, maybe two to three months in an internship and i'd love after the half hour to talk about some of our awesome employer partners um and then a couple you know extended period of job placement assistance you know that that's uh that's kind of indefinite until we can get the job done um and help place people uh you know while, while you were saying that i started thinking about you know recruitment are have you considered uh you know, going straight to the source when we talk about recovery, I mean, you know, obviously there are uh, AA and all these other programs, NA, uh, have certain certain nexuses, centers where there's a lot of, I know it's because of the pandemic, folks are, the, the entire, you know, recovery community has gone virtual. Uh, some places, I guess, are starting to have meetings again. But, you know, there's certain churches or institutions. I remember that I think there's one down by the old trade center by Trinity Church. That was a big AA location. Uh, you know, would that be a place that you would put flyers that you would try You'd be looking? Because I got to tell you that folks who are in that community, you know, uh, many times, you know, because of how much they they have gained from the process, right? The recovery process. They're interested in passing that along, obviously, to other folks in the pro in their yes. programs. But uh, they're also there. But but you know, some of them become you know move into that field after the you know the, like you said, they've done their own the work on themselves. Uh, you know, they get excited about that. And uh, I mean, I know, for example, I'll just not necessarily as a result of recovery, but my you know my wife you know, decided to become a mental health professional as a result of, you know, being in therapy, you know, she, and, uh, and being told by a therapist, you might be interested in this. And, you know, she followed her nose in that direction. And now she's, you know, uh, LCSW and, you know, psychotherapist. So, but I'm think I'm wondering if, is that something you thought about is, is going directly to the source and maybe to these, uh, these twelve-step recovery uh, locations, where uh, there's a lot of meetings of all types. Absolutely. I mean, so you make a great point about the place you'd be recruiting from. You know, you're recruiting from might also be the place where peers would work. And so it's you know we're leveraging LaGuardia and the Workforce Education Center's relationship with um, community centers, recovery centers, homeless shelters criminal justice settings, uh, child welfare agencies. Um, you know, these are these are a lot of places where, um, you know, we're not gonna be recruiting children to be peers, but the idea being that maybe there are people on the staff or in that orbit or someone has a family member who has that lived experience um, because the, you know, we really do want um, to draw people from the community to go back into the community, you know, especially in the COVID context of, 
you know, you want your neighbor to be the, the person who's kind of helping you through, um, you know, this thing you're experiencing with a lot of us are experiencing mental health issues the last couple of years, you know, it's, um, it's very, you know, all of a sudden kind of people kind of understanding what a lot of us have been going through uh, for years. I identify as someone with lived experience. So, so um, it's, it's, it's a blessing, you know, it's a silver lining that uh, people are starting to talk more deeply about it and, and have the words to describe kind of um, what's going on. Uh, yeah, and, you know, as a result of our conversation, I mean, I talked I talk to a lot of folks when I was trying to put together my testimony for uh, uh, the New York City Council. And uh, but I remember adding some language where I talked about that one of the one of the payoffs of surviving traumatic experiences is your ability to then use that experience to help others, particularly in our community. And, uh, you know, I personally and I've said that I say this in different settings, but, you know, most New Yorkers suffer from PTSD, I believe, it's just from just from the fact that we all live in a community that, you know, 9-11, yes. 9-11 alone, kind of, you know, yes. anybody who lives here lives in the shadow of that. And uh, and people who lived here while it happened, you know, we're here, we're there uh, in the day. But of course, then there's the other, all these contributing factors of the city, uh, socioeconomic issues, uh, whatever's going on, uh, you know, in their homes, uh, you know, just the stressors of living with 8 million people or sleeping with 8 million people, but working with 12 yes. every day commuting in. And now we have the, the mutual experience of, of COVID, which has been traumatizing. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just interesting because I was going to bring in a body of, of work, photographs of someone, uh, a photographer who actually you know, documented, uh, he worked in mortuaries. <laughs> and so a lot of these bodies and things. And, uh, you know, but I said to the guy who was running the gallery, I said, I don't know if this is a good idea because our kids are coming back. They have experienced death in their immediate families, parents, siblings, uh, partners, whatever. This may not be what, and, you know, we, of course we tossed it out. We decided, yeah, that's not a good idea. We're not, you know, we don't want to re-traumatize you. Walk in and see these kinds of things. Uh, as beautiful as this person makes the photographs, it's not, uh, so, you know, and I think as, you know, as working in the, in the, uh, in LaGuardia, we've all been kind of, we're supposed, we're trying to be sensitive, sensitive to, you know, what our, our students are coming to us with the, their situations. So we got all, we got enough trauma yeah, to yeah. go around. It's, it's certainly here in the city. So the question becomes, where are people in that process? Uh, we're going to be, you know, recovering from the from the COVID drama for years. Sure. So this is these are these are people who are they've already uh, been there and have yeah. come back. Yes, this right? is you, this Hannah and I believe that this is a COVID grant. This is a COVID project. This is mental health recovery in in the Queens community. Um, and, and we're putting an emphasis on youth and young adults um, because there is a children's mental health crisis. You know, six, six days ago, I think the American Pediatric Association and um, a couple other organizations said, we have a children mental health crisis in this country. It's, you know, because of COVID, um, collective trauma. And so right. we really do see this as a, you know, as being really closely tied to COVID and, and our city's recovery. And it's interesting. Well, again, it's it's number five in the president's when he did his town. I can't remember if it was town hall or which speech it was. Where he talked about the five things he wanted to be working on, and one of those was helping the Queens community come back from, uh, in this case, COVID, but just in general as being you know the support uh, place for the community. So this fits right into that. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So, well, let's get back to the grant again. So, 
20, 20 students, we'll call them. They're being trained. They get not, they're licensed, and they go through all of this. At what point do we let them go and move on to the next? Or will some of those actually stick around and help mm. others? I mean, uh, is the is the grant is the grant uh, plan organic mm. or is it more fixed? And it's and it's well, it's scary. the federal government, so it's, it's definitely fixed. But it's uh, you know we have some negotiation room within that I think because we're a new uh, new grantee. Um, you know this is a this is a employment program. You know this is a pipeline to employment program. That's how. Uh, Michelle Patterson and I see it. And so three months in the classroom. Uh, and then when they're starting the internship, we get our second cohort in. You know, they're going to start in May. We're going to have some some overlap um, in terms of training. But, you know, three months in the classroom, two months in the internship. You know, the idea is that we really develop these relationships, which we think are deep with these employer partners. Um, to set people up for employment with those organizations. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you that. That's the point of workforce development, you know, is it's to, it's to get people jobs. And so we, we're really happy with um, the organizations we've brought along to uh, with us on this project. Um, and, and, and that includes uh, the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services, which is this really cool organization that does um, basically incarceration diversion um, work. Um, and so, you know, some of our students, right, like a, one of our LaGuardia's peers might go on to, uh, you know, work for cases, um, helping people, you know, with the mental health issues that may have been contributing to their involvement with the justice system. Um, we're partnered with the Jewish Board for Family and Children's Services. Um, we're partnered with Goodwill Industries, um, and the Institute of Community Living, which is the largest peer employer uh, in the city, which was, you know, that, that was a joyous day when we had that meeting. And, and we said, hey, this, you know, we got this program. Are you interested? They said, yeah, we're interested. I was like, well, you know, this is, this couldn't be better. You know, this is, this could be better from a grant perspective, but also from a, you know, student outcomes perspective. We want the biggest employers in the city because we want our students to have the best probability of getting a job. Have you, uh, in all your dealings, have you done, have, have you had uh, any interactions with uh, folks in the academic uh, affairs division and any of the work? I think of the folks in the social science department. And like when you were talking and you were mentioning the, you know, these alternative sentencing programs, We've also got folks here uh, who are working in the criminal justice programs of social science who deal with uh, formerly incarcerated, which is another yeah. traumatic experience uh, and which keeps traumatizing because, you know, some some students, some folks who might have found, you know, recidives, you know, going back, getting going, coming out and going back in over and over again and, and trying to break that cycle. Uh, was there any of that? Uh, as part of this or and, and have you even thought about that I mean because we have for example right next door to us is the uh, the, the yes. Queens Correctional Center right there caddy corner to the yes. Van Dam diner and you know we're working in there or they are working in there so say. yes that's been a big focus of um, Hannah Michelle and I and then also VP Gupta you know this is the idea of the the one college right and President Adams like workforce it, it's another issue <laughs> it's all i i believe that on a philosophical level like this is learning you know it is all learning um but yeah of so I, yeah, yeah we all we all believe that but yeah so we've been talking to department chairs um david bimby you know who's done work on uh the community health worker a program articulation agreements with them. Right. Um, Laura Beatty. We've talked to Justin Brown. We're we're going around. We're talking to the academic departments, and we're saying, hey, you know, where can we find uh, space for collaboration here? Can we figure out some sort of credit articulation? Because the the thing is that there's a ceiling on, uh, you know, the peer uh, profession. You know, you are going to hit a ceiling in terms of earnings and uh, advancement at some point. And so our goal is to make sure that our students have in mind that that's not going to be the end of the road for you. You know, we can increase your earnings potential. You can get to the next stage of your career, 
by coming back to LaGuardia into one of these departments, you know, that are. So, yeah, starting. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. Psychology, for example, exactly. with Lara Bay. Or criminal justice. With yeah. Those folks. Who knows? Maybe, right. maybe you want to be a social worker or maybe you get a policy, you know, kind of inspiration and you want to work on that level. Um, you know, it's um, it's about planting that seed um, early and that's something. I'm sure we'll get better at over the years, but you know, that's a, certainly a priority for us at the start here. Well, I like <laughs> it. <laughs> I'll give you two names that you can read, you should, if yeah, you're please. interested in the, uh, the folks, uh, which is, uh, that are dealing with criminal justice reform is uh, John Cheney in social science and Dr. Joni Schwartz Cheney in humanities who she she's all, she comes from a background of adult continuing education and uh but she's now in our speech communication department and but they've been doing a lot of work with the formerly incarcerated students and writing about it they just published a book about the gifts that can be you know uh gleaned from the experience and uh they're very big proponents uh but they, and they had students who go on to do all kinds of things, including policy writing and things like that. So I think of those. Corey Feldman as well is another one uh, in it. And we actually all work together, or I attend. Let's say I attend meetings that they where they work uh, with uh, higher education in the prisons. So it's a kind of a thing where they're working with people that are about to transition out of prison. And sometimes they find themselves at LaGuardia, as the, and you know, and they're, by the way, they're the best. They're they're strong students. When somebody's ready to learn, it uh, can be very powerful. So we're moving into uh, the last quarter hour, believe it or not, of the show, and uh, I don't see any questions from the audience, but uh, I'd like to just kind of. Usually we talk about the future, and in, a, in some sense, the future is mapped out. As a result of the grant, so we're going to get you. You know, you're working to get your first cohort, uh, and then after that, you'll transition other cohorts. And uh, over the and this is all and this is over the course of four yes. years. Yes, four years. So we'll see what it evolves into. Uh, again, Michelle Patterson is going to be the program manager on this. Um, it's going to be her baby uh, moving forward. Um, I'm only on this project for the first year, doing the development work. Um, and then, you know, hopefully I'll be doing development in some other part of the college. But, um, you know, we'll, it's, it's, this program could be many things. Um, and I think one, one thing it could evolve into um, is more of a, a youth specific uh, peer program. Um, there are youth peers um, specifically, you know, to work with young people. Um, and we've got some people on our curriculum development team who um, are in that world um, of youth peer support work. And so, you know, I think that's a natural fit with the school too, just because, you know, we're the only, we're the only um, peer training program um, that's an educational institution. Um, we're the only ones. And so, you know, you ask yourself, oh, well, well then, you know, how could we leverage our strengths and what responsibility do we have to the peer community? And it seems like a natural fit to be a youth, you know, peer training organization. You know, we're a school. Right. I mean, when you talk about this, I think about at the Center for Teaching and Learning, they have what they call student mm. success mentors. And these are students who work uh, a lot of times with the uh, first year seminar students, students who are just freshmen who come to the college and they participate in a class where they're actually taught how to go to college in a sense, and they there they, they serve as peer mentors, but also in what we call the capstone, the last course students mm -hmm. typically take to prepare them to move on. And again, they're, they're there. And I mean, a lot of their job is, uh, is building e-portfolios and mm -hmm. kind of encapsulating their experience digitally uh, for the future. And, uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes into, you know, basically, uh, building these relationships. So a student who doesn't know how to go to college uh, could get some pointers or a student who doesn't know how to go on to the next level, uh, you know, isn't maybe even thinking of transfer, uh, might be encouraged as a result of uh, 
these student success mentors, they obviously don't, they, they work one-on-one -on -one if people approach them, but they're, they're usually working with a cohort of whatever the number, the people are in the class with 15, 20, 25 students, whatever the number might be. But so there is experience in that, that kind of relationship. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, if we're just brainstorming here, yeah. I mean, that could, it could be awesome to like take kind of that route. And I think that's something President Adams said when we were, you know, developing this was, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if, you know, the peers could be, you know, working with LaGuardia students who were going through their own mental health challenges. And, you know, it, was, you know, it's, it would be pretty incredible if we can get to that point, you know. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I talked about, again, in that testimony was the fact that as a faculty member, it's hard for us. I mean, we, we're not mental health professionals. We can't right. diagnose. We uh, And in fact, usually we don't know a student is in trouble until they've done some damage, you know, to the to their semester, you know, or they come to us. Uh, and it's been interesting because with the online experience that in some ways I've become closer to some students because since there is this ability to, to check in virtually, I don't know what it is, but it, it becomes some sort of intimacy that's developed either by, over the phone or or, or uh, one on one in Zoom meetings, whatever it is, that you start finding out quickly why uh, a student is, is struggling, you know. Uh, and, you know, some faculty might assume that, you know, it's a natural aversion to learning, but it, it's not, it's not, it's, it's typically not the case. It's usually something else that's going on. And you, our students suffer the entire gamut of pressures. But again, we won't find that out until there, something's going on. And then again, once you get them there, uh, you know, students don't have to take advantage of mental health services at the college, for example. You can't force a student to go to therapy. Uh, so they, w whether they'll do that or not. And, you know, I think it, it would be fascinating to find out what would happen if, uh, you know, let's say a student comes into a classroom and says, I am, you know, I'm here at the college, I'm with the Delta Continuing Education, I'm working, you know, as a peer mentor. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I'm looking for if you're in, if you have any interest in this uh, or could avail yourself of our services, feel free to reach out to me. Absolutely. Uh, that could be powerful. That could be powerful. You could build, you know, uh, not only possibly, you know, uh, a co students who might find themselves in the cohort, but also students who, again, would take advantage yeah. of the services, even in a, in a trial, whatever yeah. experience. Because again, this this two month trial period, I'm guessing they're working with people, right? They're going to be they're going to be working with folks, uh, and we know our students Absolutely. are struggling. Uh, they were struggling, by the they were struggling before COVID. So now it's only been exacerbated. That's an important point. And, uh, I, I, and I'll just tell you something about LaGuardia is that the hardest thing for us to do is to, is to know what, what the other person's doing. There's so much going on here. It is so hard for people to know what is available and what they could take advantage of. But again, you know, think about that. If you're interested in that, I'd be I'd be willing to uh, you know talk about that and maybe come up with a, come up with a way of doing it. I mean, particularly approaching the college senate, who's always looking, and the committee of faculty, who are always looking for, for ways to support students, and where there are actually student senators that could hear what's going on, is another way to carry the you know, message. We'd love to loop you into the program development team. We just need you know, it's just need. <laughs> Another million dollars or so, you know, we'll get that salary for you both. Oh, I, I'm, you can't pay. I are, you're, I'm already on the <laughs> payroll. You can't, uh, you know, I can't, uh, I can't draw a dime from it. But uh, what? Well, but you know, I mean, maybe sometimes what people do is they have, uh, you know, they have various constituent committees of support, like you know, a committee of faculty who yes. can serve as an advisory yes, we board. have an advisory committee. You know and then I mean? the Wellness Center is a really amazing resource and some, some fantastic people there we've been starting to collaborate with and incorporate into the program. So we have, um, you know, one Wellness Center counselor um, who was hired with that Federal CARES Act money who um, is going to be a part of the program. Um, and she's she's on That's Fridays, exciting. maybe, you know, she'll, she'll have little check-in sessions and, and uh, yeah, we're really trying to loop the whole college into this 
um, you know, in in ways that are natural, you know, in ways that feel natural. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we're almost out of time, believe it or not. So I don't know any last uh, things you'd like to say or share or anybody you want to thank. Um, well, thank you for having me on this to, to talk about this program. Um, thanks for the leadership of, you know, uh, you know, Director Weinstock, VP Gupta, you know, President Adams, everyone who's kind of um, supported this. And um, I think we're just really excited to start getting the city back on its feet in terms of mental health. I think that is the point of this program. And that's going to be a part of all of our lives and all of our families, you know, helping each other rebuild their mental health um, because it's been a traumatizing uh, couple years. And so I think um, I would just say uh, to anyone, you know, listening, maybe going through the same thing, you know, hang in there. And, uh, you know, we're going to try to um, be a part of that effort to to get people well again. Very good. Part of the uh, yeah of the of the focus on success yeah. for the community. Right. Term not 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 you're not part of the problem. You're part of the solution. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. One of those phrases. Okay. Well. Uh, Thank you, for, thank you for being on the show today. My guest here on uh, what's going on has been Ben Journey of the Division of Adult and Continuing Education. And we've been discussing a four-year, $1.6 million grant from the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration that will be utilized uh, to train students to become mental health peer support workers that are badly needed here uh, in, in uh, our Queens community to recover from the COVID pandemic. And uh, I'm glad uh, whoever it was that put us together, I think it was the president might have put us together. Uh, I'm glad we, that we, they went, and I, you know, I'm a resource, the, the, the station, consider the station a resource. I'd be interested to get Michelle on uh, to check in and whatever the next thing you move on to, to find funding for. Let's talk about that as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Hugo. All right. You're welcome. And uh, uh, my engineer, Mr. Pope, uh, please take us out as we as we begin the show today with a little more Peter Gabriel. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and take care. <laughs>